Hey there, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of The Dark Parade. This begins a new month of shows, which means uh, a new set of shows built around an idea about horror on and beneath the waves. Uh, this will uh, be a, a really fun month for me. I, I have a bit of a soft spot for uh, horror movies set in and around water. Uh, I think it's just a natural human thing, right? That we all, uh, when when sitting on a boat or, God forbid, a, a flimsy little raft or something with nothing but the open ocean beneath you, there is that fear of the unknown of what's, what's down there? What can't I see? Uh, what horrifying things might be taking place on, you know, 70% of uh, the world's surface? that I am not privy to. And so we begin a, a look at all of this, you know, scary stuff on the waves with uh, a look at the movie Orca, which is a movie, if you listen to uh, to Pick 6 Movies, you will be familiar with that film. And if you're not subscribed to Pick 6 Movies, please do. Uh, that's a, an awfully good show, I think. But as far as we're concerned here, I wanted to get away from doing something like Jaws because people have talked about Jaws ad infinitum. And Orca is an interesting animal, uh, no pun intended. And so I, uh, I've also, this month, organized a, a set of shows that not only are perhaps a little off the beaten path, if not uh, the most obvious choices. I've tried to get some hosts that we haven't really talked to on the show before, or if we have, then in a different circumstance and so forth. So the first episode is going to be with Jason Stein. You're going to hear from him in just a minute, who uh, runs a show called Dads from the Crypt. I, I can't recommend it enough. It is ostensibly about the show Tales from the Crypt, but it also brings in a lot of other filmmakers uh, who worked on that show, as well as one of the producers from Bordello of Blood. And so that uh, podcast feed hosts another show that is all about sort of what went wrong in the making of Bordello of Blood, and that's really terrific as well. Yeah, there, there's just a lot of reasons to listen to Dads from the Crypt, and I think you're going to enjoy uh, hearing from Jason on uh, on this episode so without further ado let's get this party started welcome to may on the dark parade and welcome to aquatic horrors starting with orca here is my conversation with jason folks uh welcome to uh, this part of the conversation here. We are talking about the movie Orca. I'm here with uh, Jason Stein of uh, 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 Dads from the Crypt. And Hello. Yeah, man, this is, it's exciting. We were talking beforehand. I really enjoy your podcast. I well, tend, Thank you. It is uh, just a weird factor of doing this show that I ended up talking to a lot of the same people over and over again, and I've really been uh, reaching out and trying to find some other shows that are interesting and cool. And before we get started, I give us the elevator pitch for Dads from the Crypt because it is both a really fun show and very cool and very diverse. It's not just talking about Tales from the Crypt as mm -hmm. it happens. So uh, I'll shut up. Please pitch it. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, Tales of the Crypt is the window dressing. That, that's what gets you in the door. But really, it's a podcast about fatherhood and fandom and lots of things. But basically, we are three dads who met. We've never actually met in person, um, but we met through a trivia group, a horror trivia group during pandemic and decided to go off on this wonderful podcasting journey. And every week we review a Tales of the Crypt episode. We're about a third of the way through the series and like i said we review the episode we have discussions we have guests like from other podcasts or just friends and then we also talk about dad advice sometimes completely random sometimes poignant really to the episode um it's just have fun you know you just gotta have fun these days yeah and then and on top of that it's like almost like a living history of tales of the crypt so we've had tons of directors and actors and producers who all worked on the show and right now we're actually working with a couple of the producers from the show to talk about Bordello Blood. So we have a 
kind of mini series that they're doing called uh, How Not to Make a Movie, <laughs> where they talk about everything that went wrong with this movie. That like, yeah, I don't. I'm not a huge sales script fan. I don't like that movie, but the story behind it is fascinating. Yeah, we. I, I've talked about that movie on another show, and not necessarily in a glowing light. Um, no, I but, don't think anyone could say that that movie is intentionally good. Yeah, yeah. And and I just talked to the director of it earlier today for a discussion, and I'm sure he would agree. Yeah, and that's I, what's so interesting about the sh the show that you do, and the thing that I would certainly recommend to listeners of this show to go check out is that it, like you said, the Tales from the Crypt episodes are kind of the the lure. Uh, that that gets you on the hook, but um, there it, it ju it's filled with great interviews and people that were creatives on the show, and uh, and and the other guys on the show as well are really fun. And mm -hmm. oh just... man, Mondo and Jody are the best. Mondo does everything he can to crack me up or disrupt the flow of the show, and but usually about a third, two thirds of the way through the show, I just kind of give up and let him just kind of go with it yeah there i was listening to an episode before we started talking where i i don't even remember exactly what he said but he dropped a line and you just went silent for a solid like 30 seconds yeah and just wrestling with like i don't even know what to do with this <laughs> this conversation at this point uh but it, it's wonderful i encourage everyone to check it out we'll we'll oh, thank uh, you. pimp it again on the back end of this but the reason that I have <laughs> assembled you for this is to discuss uh, the 1977 classic question mark <laughs> um, Orca the Killer Well a Dino De Laurentiis special and I always like to start off by asking what was your first encounter with Orca such as it is oh that's interesting because I'll be honest, I've never seen the... I hadn't seen the entire movie until, like, a couple days ago when I watched it for this. My first memory or really or thing that comes up is I remember collecting comic books, like, back in the 80s. And they might maybe there were 70s reprints, or for whatever reason, they had the poster advertisement for Orca in them. And maybe I was collecting, like, old, com, old comic books. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as a kid, I loved Jaws. And then I saw this print ad for orca if you've ever seen it the shark is like 50 not the shark the orca is 50 feet long the it's a it's like a drawing of this comically large orca bursting through a boat with this little guy you can see kind of holding a harpoon but he's like being like tossed around like a rag doll yeah. it's like a if, if, if a normal person picked up an ant it's it's moby dick it is yeah Right, yeah, there are people, uh, you know, the size of, you know, what is this, a whale for ants? You know, it's yeah. that kind of thing. And um, it's but wonderful. It just, it, it's wonderful, it grips your imagination, it's not at all representation of what the, is, is in the movie. Because it's just a normal size uh, uh, orca yeah. in, in the movie. Yeah. Um, but that picture's always stuck with me. Um, and for whatever reason, I never really got my, it was, it's not a very well known movie or very accessible. Like you don't usually see it, at least when like you're looking at, uh, video shells back in the day. Mm -hmm. So for whatever reason I ever saw it, but I, I've caught it on TV a couple times and you know, you can find sometimes YouTube clips of the more infamous scenes that we'll get into, uh, oh pop God. up. So it's definitely like been circling in my head. And then when we start talking, you give me a list of movies to watch that were aquatic themed. I saw Orca. I'm like, oh, th I've always needed an excuse, a good excuse to watch that movie. Mm -hmm. Like, sit down and just give it that go. And this was it. You know, to talk about the poster briefly, I yes. like the fact that it, it has disinformation right on the poster. Yes. Uh, because the uh, you described the picture and there was some text there. That goes, the killer whale is one of the most intelligent creatures in the universe. Mm, okay, I'll yeah. give that to you. I mean, on, on what scale, but okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a big universe, but whatever. Incredibly, it goes on. He is the only animal other than man who kills for revenge. Not not true. Yeah. Uh, the chimpanzee, at the very least, is known for this. But, uh, alright. Alright, Orca. I'm still with you. 
then it gets to the outright lie, which is he has one mate, and if she is harmed by man, he will hunt down that person with a relentless, terrible vengeance across seas, across time, across all obstacles. Now, that yeah. is the plot of the movie. But wait, wait, wait. Across time? If, if this was a time-traveling orca movie... It's... That should be the sequel. I, where I the orcas, if... orcas descendants travel through time to hunt down Richard Harris's descendants. I want to hear Orca say to Linda Hamilton, I came across <laughs> time for you, Sarah Connor. <laughs> um, but Orca, Orca is... for Alright, so the female uh, killer whales actually do have this very... Uh, close bond with their calves and raise them. But orcas, because, you know, not to spoil anything, but these are dolphins. And dolphin males, whether it's killer whale or male dolphins, are just there to get down and get out. Mm. Like, they are not they are not monogamous creatures. Right. And, and sometimes sexually assaultive, as we have learned uh, in the history of dolphins, uh, which is terrifying. That is maybe the scariest thing yeah, about that, any that's... aquatic animal is that you don't want to be left alone with a dolphin. Yeah. It's like a real Epstein situation. And God. anyway. Dolphin Epstein? Yeah. It's, you know, Flipper Epstein was in the family. Oh, God. <laughs> oh God. Hey, look, Free Willy ain't just. Oh, no. Yeah, sorry. No, sorry, no, sorry, sorry. Um, but... <laughs> I, on the other hand, like, I saw this movie a ton when I was a kid. I you know, I was way too young to really appreciate everything that was really disturbing about it, I think. It's only as an adult when you go back and watch this movie that you're like, oh, wow, this is wrongheaded in so many ways. But um, also bold. Like it, the, the thing I like about Orca, I will say up front, is it swings for the fences. It's, it swings for a fence. I don't know <laughs> what fence that is. So, well, but, uh, so D Dino De Laurentiis, of course, uh, had done King Kong. Mm -hmm, the the year 70, before. Yeah, 76. Yeah. Which is another movie that is not very good, but I still have a lot of fondness for it. Uh, mostly because Jeff Bridges has maybe the best hair that has ever oh, yeah. been in a movie. He, yeah, it's rivaling... Um... Kurt Russell in The Thing. Yes. Which we'll, we'll talk about, too. Yeah, it's just this beautiful mane of hair. It's so good. Uh, so I <laughs> I watched Orca a bunch as a kid. Uh, it, it has followed me forever. And I am a sucker for an animal attack movie. Right. If now, it's... When you watched on the kid, were you renting the video or did you see it on TV? I feel like this was an HBO kind of vibe. Okay. You know, like the early days of HBO when they were like, look, there are 12 movies in existence. We've right. got well, the rights that. to three of them, so we're going to show them all the time. Right. Well, I asked that because there's certain movies I remember seeing on network TV a lot, but they cut things out, especially content. Yeah. I'm, I'd be curious what they would cut out for this movie. Like, the scene uh, that I'm, I'm, I keep alluding to, but we haven't got to yet. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to it early enough. But yes, there there is a scene in this movie, and I remember seeing it uh, when I was a kid, because it's the one scene uh, that, child or adult, it makes you sit up in your chair and... and it's... Yeah, it's like, really fucked up. What are we doing now? Um, yeah. It... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's the, all right. And the thing that I, I respect about this is De Laurentiis said early on, you know, they don't show Jaws in Jaws that much. So we're going to show the hell out of a killer whale. It's a choice. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't like when, hey, we'll get into. This. So uh, th the plot of this thing such as it is and uh we will try not to linger too much on the one scene but oh my goodness um so it it basically begins with uh charlotte rampling uh, hiding from a shark <laughs> which is real dumb i right. like i like that she's like oh there's a shark so i'm gonna hide by this reef and, sh and she's trying to cover herself with a rock which falls <laughs> and the shark is like, huh? What's that? <laughs> yeah. It's nonsense. Uh, 
but I adore it. Um, and so she is being assaulted by this shark and uh, she's got uh, her kind of first mate who is Robert Carradine a guy named Ken in this movie uh, aka the guy who is an Anthony Edwards from Revenge of the Nerds uh, oh. or, or Booger not not Booger either um, <laughs> but yeah he yeah, was, I was trying to figure out where I knew him from yeah I know him weirdly the role that I know most from Robert Carradine is a speaking of HBO it was a made for HBO sort of play about the Chicago 8 oh okay. uh, and it was really good and it has stat cast it's like uh, Ellie Gould and Robert Loggia and uh, Robert Carradine was in it a um, number of actors that you would recognize and uh, but anyway, it, he was uh, Rennie Harlan, maybe? Or Tom Davis, one of those? But anyway, he wasn't Abby Hoffman. Uh, anyway, so he was in that. Uh, and then you have... <laughs> the When we were going back and forth about this movie, the one of the things that really made me laugh was you saying, I'm really excited to talk about Dumbledore versus a whale. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is who we have front and center in this movie, is Richard Harris um as, as as not dumbledore but in fact uh this guy named nolan but he's Dumbledore. yeah as as off uh, yeah he can't unsee dumbledore but he's as different from dumbledore as you can get yeah he's mm, definitely more drunk yes which was uh a part of the problem in the filming of this movie is that richard harris is notoriously on the sauce um behind the scenes and in front of the camera and uh so he is a guy who makes his living catching kind of big game fish so he sees this shark and the light bulb go goes off like hey we're gonna catch this shark and make us some money and and also by the way we're gonna get charlotte rampling and her buddy uh onto the ship um so and out of harm's way but before they can, uh, I think Ken is the one who's in danger. Robert Carradine's character has fallen into the water. It is about to get et by this shark. And then out of nowhere, this shark gets blowed up, like bounced out of the water. Yeah. It, just a geyser of blood and shark parts. And, uh, of course, there's a great moment where, you know, Richard Harris says, like, God in heaven, what is that? And it turns out, of course, this is a killer whale. And uh, so the, the orca, the killer whale, destroys the shark, saves Ken. And so Richard Harris is like, well, I got me to get me one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Uh, he goes after uh, a killer whale of his own and is trying, like, like they end up following a pod of whales here and they're trying to get a bull, trying to get a, a male whale, but they don't. They get a lady whale and they Well, he's shooting for the male and like he misses, like he nips the fin. Right. So whenever you see this fin later in the movie, you're like, ah, that's that no. orca. Yeah. Uh, it's, again, because we're showing everything. There are no barrels like in Jaws or anything. You see a lot of this, uh, a lot of this orca. And, and let me just say, I don't think the effects are like that much further behind Jaws, per se, for the time. Mm-hmm. The difference is that the continuity isn't there because they're seeing because they're they're mixing stock footage with animatronic uh, whale. I keep saying whale, but orca. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you can tell the stock footage has a, like a sunlight reflection, even when it's at night. I mean, when they switch to the animatronic uh, one. Oh yeah, and there's also the shots that are clearly shot at SeaWorld. Yeah, where exactly. Where they're just in a tank. And Which okay, fine, but again, the continuity of day and night doesn't, often doesn't match, and that just yeah. really breaks it. Because they did the same thing in Jaws, pretty much. 
Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You'll. You, in fact, the same team that shot some of the underwater jaw stuff shot some of the underwater orca stuff. Hmm. So they they end up nicking the fin on the male, hitting this female, and Nolan is, you know, it's just like, well, six of one, half dozen of the other. Let's drag her onto. Uh, onto the boat and there are a lot of shots as they're like hauling this female whale uh killer whale onto the back of the boat and stringing her up there but, are well, hold on you're, you're skipping the beat oh go on where the where the female whale tries to swim into the rudder or the propeller oh right yeah she tries to kill herself she tries to kill herself Right, rather than be like, you'll never take me alive. Yeah, I'm like, what? <laughs> Which is even more shocking for what's about to happen. Right, right. Like, this is a real parental situation here because she, a, after trying to kill herself by diving into the rudder, and they pull her up, and um, then they. This whale, this killer whale has a miscarriage like yeah i'm sorry is it a miscarriage is she like forcing herself to ha abort i mean question I mark i don't know that any of this stacks up to no no signs. nothing it's completely ridiculous but it is shocking yeah you see yeah this unborn whale fetus coming out of this whale yeah being, that's been strung up so it's completely like it's right there yeah. And, and they actually, did you notice they set this up because um, Nolan is like chatting up the uh, Rachel Bedford, who's like the shark scientist. And like she's like in a classroom and she's talking about wh how similar whale fetuses are to human fetuses. Mm -hmm. So they already teed this up by showing you like a slide. For right. And this is where the thing on the poster comes from, where she gives this whole speech about, you know, how orcas are brilliant and vengeful and all those things and but, yeah but yeah at, to your point though when you see this whale fetus hit the deck it looks like a little baby yeah it's it's like got that pink hue yeah it's fins look like fingers it's oh it's so weird and richard harris in fairness reacts properly to this it, situation I can't if, if they if anyone doesn't just is not in shock of this scene then you are a replicant <laughs> right they, they give you the uh what, what was the name of the test the uh, I can't whatever remember. but yeah, yeah it's like they ask you if you have uh how you would react if you saw a tur uh, tur tur turtle on its back and then show you this scene and yeah. it the like the the whale is screaming it's just this hey that's yeah, yeah, the male whale is like sitting out there. It's like, it's like its head out, and you just go like flipping out. Yeah, yeah, and also clocking Richard Harris, and and the rest of the crew like mm -hmm. you sons of bitches. I mean, you can't blame them, but no. <laughs> I, I wish they had. They would have done a um, voiceover. <laughs> I want to see a cut of Orca with Samuel Jackson as the voice of the Orca. Oh yeah, J you a motherfuckers. Lot of Get that, get that motherfucking fetus off that motherfucking boat. Yeah, it that, uh, yeah, I, we could probably make that happen. There's a, there's enough money floating around in Hollywood to this, make that happen. Well, there's gonna be like an AI generator. We can just feed lines. Right, right. It's like, it would like they do the uh, the Peter Cushing stuff. Mm -hmm. We'll just get one of one of them programs. But so this feed, and it, it truly is one of the most shocking things in the movie easily the most shocking thing in the movie oh yeah and richard harris is like get that off of my boat and so they just hose it off the side of the boat off. oh my god and then richard harris like cuts the the female orga loose is just like i have made a horrible horrible mistake <laughs> and all of this has gone horribly wrong and i want to get that off the boat i want the baby well, off the boat all well, of don't this they realize 
at some point that somehow it's still alive. It's been like half an hour or something like that. It, yeah, well, I think it's still like when they get it over the side, it still kind of feebly swims a little or something. Yeah. And, and then, yeah. So, it's... oh, and also Keenan Wynn, who who we, we did not mention earlier, but old veteran actor Keenan Wynn, best known for being crotchety. Um, is hanging off the side of the boat, like trying to get this whale free. And as soon as she hits the water, Orca is like, well, there's no time like the present to begin revenge. And jumps up, grabs this old man off the mast and just drags him down into the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so we have our first kill like the you know in a in a perfect world eye for an eye keenan win dies for the female orca plus uh, i don't know maybe you do go ahead and get bo Derek's leg to make up for the unborn baby done and done are you saying that they uh richard harris and um keenan win are lovers look it's <laughs> it, it gets lonely out on the ocean. <laughs> they seem to have a very special relationship and also seem to enjoy booze. And that mm -hmm. combination of factors I think will uh will lead to a little shipboard romance, yes. So short answer See, yes, long answer all of that. So this is what I like to do. I like to rewrite the movie as we go along. Let's just keep it just keep yeah. improving. So Richard Harris now distraught over the loss of his lover um <laughs> so, all right so the, the the orca meanwhile has taken its it, its mate and pushes this thing onto the shore of the local fishing village that richard harris and his crew are calling home for the fishing season or whatever and uh, a crowd kind of gathers on the shore to see this orca now washed up. And this is the first time we get our uh, introduction to Will Sampson, who uh, who plays uh, a, an aloof named Jacob Umalak. And he just shows up to be like, huh, you suck. Look at what yeah. you've done. <laughs> like, you're in trouble, man. Like... We believe that these orcas are the, you know, spirits of great warriors and whatnot, and you are fucked, he, sir. Yeah, I mean, he's playing the, the mystical ethnic character trope. Very much so, but this was as common in 70s movies in particular. Well, yes. Yeah. It is, it, it, horror movies in particular, like this and Prophecy, um, just any number, uh, the, uh, the Manitou, you know, it name a, a 1970s horror film, and there's probably a Native American somewhere in that movie saying mystical stuff. I mean, he shows up in Poltergeist too. You yeah, know? that's like mid 80s. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because uh, I just, just finished reading Men, Women, and Chainsaws, and oh, nice. the that movie, Poltergeist two in particular, is mentioned uh, along with Prophecy, strangely. Um, probably why I've got it on the brain, because that's another, you know, killer animal movie. But, uh, you know, it, it is always mentioned in relation to, like, okay, this character represents the old ways, the, the uh, sort of mythic but generally correct view of the world, whereas, you know, Nolan is much more the, the modern man and, and has to be convinced that this uh, killer whale is actually going to come after him because he's not. He's like, it's just a fish. What are you going to do? You know? Mm -hmm. And then he goes to church. One of my favorite scenes in the movie, I, I genuinely think this is a fascinating scene. Yeah. Is when he goes to church to, to ask the priest, like, you know, they're obviously making arrangements for his lover who is now dead and, and, and you know, either in an orca belly or at the bottom of the sea. And he's making some uh, arrangements on that front, but is also saying, you know, like, listen, father, do you, do, you, do you think you can commit a sin against a fish? 
And the priest is like, what? Um, I mean, maybe, I guess. Like, what, have you, what have you been doing with those fish? Right. Like, is it because that your lover is dead now? Is that where you've turned oh, in this God. time of need? <laughs> have you met a dolphin? <laughs> but I think, oh, Dumbledore. <laughs> but I, I, Richard Harris for for all of the goofing I'm going to do on this movie, I really think he gives a good performance. I, I mean, yeah. Spoiler: I think everyone try is trying really, really hard for what they're given. Absolutely, absolutely. Like everybody thought they were making a good movie. Yeah, they all thought they were making a Jaws. Movie. Right. Jaws remake or something. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, the William Girdler was making Grizzly. Uh, De Laurentiis is, uh, and Michael Anderson uh, are are doing this movie. Joe Dante's doing Piranha. Like everybody's doing their spin on it, and this is pretty. It, it's as much Moby Dick as it is Jaws, though. Yeah, and that's kind of what I find interesting about it because it's not just oh, this killer whale showed up and, and is eating everybody and we've got to stop it. It's more that, oh, Richard Harris has committed this grave sin against this killer whale and now it is, like, truly man versus nature. And, all right, so there's a local guy named Swain who shows up and is also giving Richard Harris plenty of guff about, like, you need to take care of this. Like this whale pushed this dead female whale up onto the shore and it's going to be a problem. So you need to take care of your whale. And Richard Harris is like, it's not my whale. It's just a whale. And is trying to blow all this off. But you know, everybody in town kind of knows that he was out there hunting killer whales or at least suspects it and they're telling him like hey because this killer whale has come into you know the the local waters it's scaring off of all the fish we, we're not we're not able to make a living you need to take care of this problem and as soon as Richard Harris like <laughs> basically gives a foot in, uh, uh, you know, like a line in the sand, kind of like, this is not my whale, this is not my problem, you guys are overreacting, this is a bunch of superstition, this whale is not going to be a problem, it then just starts sinking boats in the harbor. You know, like right on cue, <laughs> here comes mm -hmm. Orca to, to sink all the local uh, fishing boats. And and then also one night, like, breezes in to uh, blow up fuel reserves. Oh, this is my favorite part. Right. Which implies, and this is the part that maybe, look, I'll, I'll buy all of the other stuff, but you try to tell me that this whale understands the concept of fuel and fuel lines as well as how to create a fire. I'm just yeah. not sure that orcas well, are there yet. No, he just like bumps up against one um, pipe. Uh -huh. The pipe ruptures, explodes, and leads a fire all the way back to this model of a gas factory or fueling fueling storage that blows up on like the side of a of a hill. Yeah, and then triumphantly jumps out of the water in front of it, which is obviously just like they show the same shot of a whale like jumping out but they obviously did it like on the uh, like a pane of glass so they could just put it over different scenes <laughs> right yeah it's great I, it's like two oh, bad special it. effects make a spectacularly bad one It. I love it I love it so I, much I love it but it's like who was watching this and thinking that hey, we got that shot I think it's the same way that I love seeing Godzilla roll into Tokyo and just destroy a, a really good model Mm -hmm. It's that no. same thing of like, oh, I know all of this is fake, but somebody was like, all right, yes, of course we're going to have to have the explosion, but we also need this triumphant leap out of the water from our hero, the orca, right. at the same and, time. 
And there's one earlier in the movie where it's like both the male and the female are doing it, and it's obviously the same shot, just like duplicated. Yeah, it's like mirrored next yeah. to each other. Mirror, yeah, mirrored on each other. It's like what? Oh, it's so good. So, Doctor Rachel Bedford, aka Charlotte Rampling. Um, tells him, like, look, if this orca is after you, you need to stay away from it. Because the way she puts it is, what he wants isn't necessarily what he should have. And Okay. Yes. Well, my wife walked in the room, right, at that line, and then she starts sing- singing, what a whale wants, what a whale needs. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I can think about. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of how I often sing the song, uh, Springtime for, uh, for Hitler from the producers. <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, about giving my dog a treat. So, you know, yeah, there you go. sometimes, sometimes you gotta irritate yourself. Um, but <laughs> yeah, you, you should not give the whale what he wants. And there's this whole nighttime conversation where she thinks he's going out to appear to shoot this whale. And he's like, I'm, that's not what I'm here to do. I want to, I, I figured if I could go out to the point, see the whale and look him in the eye, that he would understand that this was an accident. And, and I really genuinely like Richard Harris's delivery of this, where he says, um, and then I could tell him I didn't mean to, cause I didn't mean to. And it's this really earnest, like I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking ahead enough to realize what I was doing. And I certainly wasn't trying to, you know, kill his wife and his unborn child. (laughs) And, oh, by the way, let me tell you my tragic backstory, which is that I, my wife and child were killed by a drunk driver. And so, you know, we've kind of established that the, the Orca and Richard Harris are strangely kind of the same character. Hmm. Only the orca is now, you know, a murderous. He is he is after blood in a way that Richard Harris was not. Which also, bring, uh, you know, it's jumping ahead a little bit, but there's a line he has later in the movie where he says, like, you know, the orca loved his family more. And, right. You know, which is a, a weird begrudging respect that Richard Harris gives him. He goes through. He goes through it in this movie. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like he's de- he's dealing with a lot. Not only are his wife and kid gone, he's recently lost his lover Keenan Wynn. Um, <laughs> in the next sequence, um, they're they basically decide like, hey, we're gonna we're gonna get out of town. And uh, so there's a guy we haven't talked about much because he doesn't matter much to this movie. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, played by Peter Hooten is the actor's name. Guy who plays Paul, who's sort of the boyfriend of Bo Derek, who plays Annie. Another character that doesn't really matter that much in this movie. Um, they're, just, they're padding. Yeah, but there is this whole sequence where like Peter Hooten is going to get... Um, like the car gassed up and they're going to pack up and they're just going to get the hell out of town and whatever happens happens. But he sort of gets stopped by a bunch of the locals who are like, no, 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 you are not leaving town. You need to get on your boat and go take, if not kill this orca at the very least, get it away from our town. Right. Yeah. They're like trying to fix up his, his boat was damaged in the in, in the first sequence so they're trying to get it fixed up as quickly as possible like day and night they're working yeah to get them out of town and and do not want them leaving under the cover of night or anything and meanwhile though that leaves richard harris and bo Derek alone in his house on stilts on the water at which point the orca uh attacks by just again assuming that the orca understands architecture and the basic laws of physics or where he lives like did the orca like <laughs> leap out of the water find the yellow pages right and well, look up his address and he, like ask around for directions he couldn't even do that because it's clear richard harris is renting right so it would ha- it would have to be a real 
like, hey, do you know a guy? He's uh, he he's gonna play Dumbledore. He looks like he'd make a great wizard in about <laughs> thirty years. <laughs> do you see someone who will eventually make a wonderful wizard and then die tragically before the film series can conclude? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh he's... that guy, yeah. He was on the one on the stilts. If you hit the third one from the right, it'll just collapse, but look like a model as it does. Ah, perfect. Hey, don't tell him I asked. <laughs> I want to be a surprise. It's yeah, the birthday. I want to. Yeah, I'm gonna show up, and it's it's really gonna put him on his heels. He's really gonna be surprised. Uh, but yeah, so this orca starts banging into the stilts, which spills the uh the house it lists you know towards the water Bo Derek ends up like sliding out the door and as Richard Harris is is you know throwing her a net to drag her back up to safety the orca jumps onto the you know the platform the the house that's dipped into the water grabs her leg which happens to be in a cast because of an earlier injury and just bites it off and mm -hmm. disappears into the night i would have given anything this would have been an oscar winning movie if it would just like bit the cast off but not her leg it's like <laughs> slipped it off like that would i mean they all just look around like oh okay Right, <laughs> and the orca's just swimming around gnawing on his cast, like you know, you can give a dog like one of those chewy bones. Uh huh. He's like, wait a second. Hey, I I I was looking for the chewy center, and I just got the delicious where's, outer coating. Where's the cream filling? Yeah. Um, a, a question Bo Derek has been asked more than once in her film career. Uh, mostly <laughs> on Tarzan the Ape Man. But they, never, they don't really confirm until, like, one throwaway line that she actually survives. Because, like, you cut off a leg like yeah. that, you're going to bleed out, like, immediately. It's well, a major artery. Yeah, and Richard Harris is pretty quick to say, like, she was a beautiful girl, and now she's maimed for life, and no one will ever want her. I'm like, it's Bo Derek. I'm sure she could do all right. Right, like, one leg or not. Like, she went from a 10 to an 8? <laughs> You know? Have you seen Have you seen Fresh? I just came oh, out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I certainly have. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Okay, yeah, you know what I'm talking about then. Yeah, yeah. A good movie, by the way. Great movie. Yeah. Uh, it's the year of the Stan. <laughs> right, man, Sebastian Stan. I, I I made the same point that between uh, the 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 uh, Pam and Tommy and Fresh. Oh, so good. That yes. yeah, he's just like has emerged from that winter soldier thing as mm -hmm. like oh he's a really good diverse actor right um and and makes a wonderful creep as it as it turns out <laughs> there's he has a bit of a uh, a stuntman mike vibe at the end yeah. of that movie that i really like yeah that was great <laughs> so but we, we digress yeah yeah so uh, Bo Derek been maimed for life. No man will ever want her again, according to Richard Harris. And uh, so now it's just Richard Harris, his buddy Paul, as as crew members. So he decides, all right, well, I gotta I gotta go out and go mono e fisho with the orca. And for no good reason, Charlotte Rampley is like, okay, well, me and me and Revenge of the Nerds are gonna come with you. Yeah, I was wondering about that, if that makes any sense. Like, I mean, she's emotionally involved, but this seems like a suicide mission from the start. <laughs> it really does, because this, the orca understands fire and real estate. <laughs> and you want to go onto its home turf? All right. Um, but there's sort of an implication throughout the movie that, like, Charlotte Rampling has some kind of romantic interest in yeah, Richard I was Harris. surprised that they never, they, they don't, like, officially get together. They, like, lay next to each other for warmth? Yeah. <laughs> Once they go to the the Arctic Circle. Arctic. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, and but it's kind of interesting. Like, I do like the fact that the movie shows a little bit of restraint 
yes, in, that, that, in that one area. <laughs> it like, yeah, it will show you an aborted whale fetus screeching. <laughs> but it's like, you know what? Let's, we're a tasteful movie. This is a class operation. We're classy. So, yeah, she goes, and also Will Sampson is like, hey, I'll come along too on account of me knowing all kinds of stuff about killer whales or whatever. Uh, also, I understand Dr. Rachel Bedford going way more than I understand Jacob Umalak going. Yeah, I'll give it that. But, and also if I were Robert Carradine, I would be like, you know what? I'll see you when you get back. You, yeah. You're the whale expert. You don't need a second. And this seems crazy dangerous. Which, you know, comes to show, it comes out to be, you know, a good point for him. Yeah. Because he gets killed off, like, immediately. And so they start following this whale, because the whale's pretty quick to make itself seen. And the whale just gives him a little fin, like, over here, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> it's obviously like a part of its stunt program at SeaWorld, like yeah. stock footage. Absolutely. So... Uh, Richard Harris goes to to follow the whale. Um, R Robert Carradine becomes a victim when he just leans over the side at one point, and the orca just jumps up and grabs him for an afternoon snack. He gets, he gets orked. <laughs> right. Borked by the orca. Oh, God. And they go all the way to the, the Strait of Belle Isle uh, is where they are, and then... Paul goes, uh, is like breaking up some ice or something and in a lifeboat and the orca bumps him out of the boat and eats him, drags him down into the depths. So now it's just Charlotte, Dr. Rachel Bedford, Richard Harris, and Will Sampson. And then, uh, they're like, oh, well, we're, we're kind of good and screwed because we're like, we're running out of fuel we can't get back um the whale by the way sh rams the ship with an iceberg because apparently he saw titanic too right <laughs> he, well he's a time traveling whale so he went to the future so titanic titanic's gonna be one of the biggest movies in the world he, these guys would love an iceberg right well it, there are a lot of reasons that an orca would really enjoy the movie titanic and uh you know it's the the biggest movie in the world and of course orcas coming back from the future are like oh my god when you get there you have to see titanic <laughs> it's That's imagine a bunch of orcas in the movie theater watching titanic together with little hats and overcoats <laughs> so that, you know eating popcorn with their fins <laughs> yeah <laughs> with their little fetus sitting with them oh yeah yeah covering covering the fetus eyes with a fin when the guy <laughs> hits the rudder oh he's a little young for this um, yeah, the love story was extraneous, but it seemed really the detail was nice. Um, anyway, so <laughs> after after uh, crippling the boat, uh, Nolan goes out to you know basically fight this thing with a harpoon, and uh, Doctor Rachel Bedford follows him out because she's like, no, you can't you know fight him like this and while hanging out on the boat making an sos call uh doctor or not doctor jacob umalak just gets crushed by a bunch of ice falling yeah avalanche it's in the ocean really anticlimactic ending for a character that it turns out didn't matter that much to begin with no but still kind of a bummer yeah I, yeah i was, I was really that wasn't a great one. Yeah. Because at least everybody else is getting, you know, eaten by the orca. And that's something. Yeah. He just he got killed by ice. Um, it's like Han Solo. Hmm. But <laughs> anyway, so now it's just Dr. Rachel Bedford and Dumbledore out on the ice. The orca. Uh, and the ship's sinking, too. Right. Yeah. The ship's going they, down. They made they made one quick SOS call, and then the ship starts sinking. Right, so th there's no guarantee that any help is coming at all. Mm -hmm. Although, it turns out there is. But as far as any of our human characters know, and probably the Orca too, the Orca 
probably knows how all of this is going to work out because of the future of travel. The future, yeah. He went in the future, saw the rented the movie, <laughs> and went back in time. Like, okay, I know what's going to happen. So, yeah. what happens to my wife? Oh, Whoa. no wonder I'm it's, so mad. It's kind of like, kind of, so actually, it's like the arrival where he like he like knows. If he like hooks up with this one female orca, that this terrible thing is going to happen to her and their unborn child. What, uh, he knows he can't escape that fate because he's already seen the movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, uh, about time when Bill yeah. Nye sniffs out like, "Oh, you're coming back to see me because I'm dead, aren't I?" Um, <laughs> the, there's probably some of that. Like Orca's unborn kid comes back to visit him when yeah. like off screen. We don't see this scene, but. It's like, why are you coming back? Oh, am I going to die at the end of this? Um, Exactly what happens. (laughs) So, anyway, the orca gets gets Dumbledore isolated by kind of chipping away at this ice flow. And um, there's a moment where Richard Harris has a gun pulled on him, like a rifle. And he just can't shoot him. And, like, you see the reflection of Richard Harris in the orca's eye. You see a reflection of the orca in Richard Harris's eye. And they're like, oh, this is... Again, from a writing point of view, I understand what they're going for here. That, oh, these are kind of the same character. And that he's... It's hard for him to kill the orca because of what he's experienced with this drunk driver killing his family. But... (sighs) I see this is the least subtle movie I've ever seen where I think I know exactly what they're going for every single second of this movie. Oh yeah. Well just it be- lets you know. Yeah, just because uh your movie has themes doesn't mean you have to hide them. Um but or yeah. Be, yeah. So the the whale ends up kind of jumping onto the ice and it you think for a second it's going to be a full quint where Richard Harris is just going to slide down into the orca's open mouth. But that's not what happens. The whale just wants Richard Harris in the water. And once Richard Harris is kind of, you know, waiting uh, in in the ice-cold ocean, the whale just uses its tail like it's going after seals or something and flips Richard Harris up into the air where he smacks into an iceberg you know like a it's like a wily coyote death yes and dr rachel bedford watches as richard harris sinks into the briny depths the orca now his vengeance satisfied swims away and that's kind of it. There, a helicopter shows well, up to pick up right. Rachel Bedford. Right. Yeah. And it flings. So it like flings her like a toy with its tail at her feet. Mm-hmm. Like right now, it has great aim. So it must have spent some time in the in the future at uh, SeaWorld to learn these tricks. So it gonna... knows that it can uh, <laughs> or come back camp. and do yeah, and it it can do these uh, to be more effective killer. Um. Now, the question, now, I've seen debate, and this is an IMDb thing, where, like, someone says the whale does actually go off and die under the ocean, under the ice. Do you think so? Yeah, I, I, I It makes to, sense thematically, it, but. Right, and that's why I say yes, because there's nothing in the movie that really tells you that that's what happens. Um, other than, hey, it swims under the ice and it can't. You know, we the last time we see the orca, it's swimming under the ice and hasn't surfaced. Um, and the characters mention that, like, oh, it's taking us to the Arctic. That's bad for us. Like, yeah, but bad for it if it gets stuck under the ice. Right. So, and you're right. Thematically, it makes sense. And that's kind of why I think that's what happens. But the movie does a really poor job of explaining that that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know what? Do, what do you think? What? Where do you land on that? I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm probably the same. Like thematically, it makes sense. They, they just not movie's just not good enough to <laughs> get that one point home. Yeah. If that's one failing of this movie. Well, speaking of failings of this movie, 
let let us get into the less uh, plot driven points, and uh, and start with the cast, which is maybe the best thing about the movie. Second, I got one thing that's, that tops it. Okay, um, but it, like we we've touched on this, but Richard Harris giving an honest to goodness real performance, I think he's kind of great in it. For what? Yes, for the dialogue he's given, he does a great job with it. Yeah, and I kind of I, I'm just partial to Richard Harris. I think he's a good actor. I I like watching him work, and I think he he brings a gravitas to this that you absolutely need for the silliness of this movie. Oh, the, the, yeah, the cast is I mean is really good top to bottom because he's also a gladiator and Unforgiven. Mm-hmm. And going back to like what Lion and Winter and stuff like that. I mean, mm-hmm. he's just you know a a, a terrific actor and even i i watched that uh first harry potter movie not so very long ago and he's good in that he's you know it's a small part but he's good in it Mm -hmm. and yeah he's he's one of the greats uh and tells some of the best stories about drinking with other british actors that you're ever gonna hear um I, i highly recommend looking up any richard harris appearance on any talk show ever and it's a delight um Charlotte Rampling, of course, who, uh, uh, you know, is maybe most famous for, like, the Night Porter, although she was in, I think she was in Game of Thrones, every, every... I think everyone, yeah. Yeah. She was in the new Dune movie. She was. She was. She was also in Zardoz. Yeah. So, if you've never seen Zardoz, then I can't recommend it enough, because that's Sean Connery in a mankini oh that's that movie yeah. yeah okay i need to see that it's it's a real something uh that is speaking of swinging for the fences that is a movie that is unlike anything you will ever see uh which i i makes me respect it at least a little bit i dig it but yeah so charlotte rampling she's she's good as the earnest you know professor that makes a lot of poor decisions about yeah. where she's gonna vacation she says one of those British accents that you can just listen to, like, that's just soothing. You can just, like, listen to her read the phone book. Yeah. You know, going back into the past and get, getting a phone book and just it's, reading it to you. And it's just so, it's just so relaxing. Um, yeah. she She's really great. Bo Derek, this is her, technically, the second movie she was ever in, but the first movie released. I think Fantasies came out after this movie. Um, yeah, and her character is, is, is nothing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the rest of the cast kind of doesn't matter. Like, Will Sampson feels like he's going to be important and then isn't. Right, and, and he was, we haven't mentioned, he's chief from um, One Fool of the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, and as well as, uh, uh, as you pointed out. I mean, many, yeah. Poltergeist too. Uh, yeah. Perhaps his finest. I, actually, the, <laughs> probably my favorite role is, uh, even though it's pretty small, is that little bit party as an outlaw Josie Wales. Where I'm sorry, what? Outlaw Josie Wales. Oh, I don't know that one. Check oh, that out. you should absolutely see that. That is classic 70s uh, Western. Oh, but, okay, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think I've seen Now I'm looking at the poster. It looks more familiar. Yeah, he has this great moment where uh, Clint Eastwood as Josie Wales rides out to talk to him because he, like, they're setting up a homestead. And it's uh, mm-hmm. like uh, the whole conversation is like, is this going to be a problem? Like, are you going to kill us? <laughs> And uh, and Clint Eastwood gives it this whole speech about like, hey, we are not here to, you know, take your land. We are not here to do anything but to try to eke out a living. And if that is going to be an issue, then trust me when I say this, I will kill all of you. <laughs> and, and, and Will Sampson has this great line where he says, I see that your words are made of iron. And you're like, oh, this is borderline racist but it's also a great speech and uh anyway will sampson terrific actor has nothing to do in this movie other than to you know sound vaguely mystical but again it, nothing ever comes of it and it's a, right. it's a real shame um you know keenan win fine you know as as uh nolan's lover um yeah, it's everybody else in the movie is just kind of window dressing. It's really Richard Harris's movie. Uh, is this going to be one of those Mandela effects for everyone who listens to this? Is actually going to be convinced that they really are lovers? 
I can only hope. That would be that would be a thing. Yeah, I would love to be on Twitter and see, you know, some meme about Richard Harris Ship, and Keenan yeah. Wynn. Shipping <laughs> shipping Novak and Nolan. <laughs> right. Um no, Novak. Yeah. What uh, what would you call that? Uh it's it's Novak. Novak, it would be their their couple name. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and Keenan Wynn's older, so why not give him the credit for, you know, the bulk of the name? <laughs> uh, Nolan and Novak, it's tough to smoosh together and get a good one. Um, and as far as IMDb is concerned, uh, Richard Harris's first name is just Captain. Oh, there you go. So, that's yeah, not great. Um, any other thoughts on the cast before we... No, it's actually a very accomplished cast. And again, the director did um, Logan's run right before this. He did the around the world in 80 days um so he's he's an accomplished director so you've got a lot of pieces there yeah yeah well let's <laughs> let's get into why maybe those pieces don't fit together so well um so thematically there is as you pointed out this movie always telegraphs what it's trying to tell you um and there, so there's some stuff uh, under the hood about animal rights and how, you know, it, these are intelligent creatures and by going into their domain and murdering them and, and upsetting the natural order that humanity is ultimately going to find itself on the wrong end of the orca stick, um, which is not unusual for a movie made at this time, you know, not just the... Mm -hmm big animals eating you but there were a million movies about you know like kingdom of the spiders is about how we use ddt and now tarantulas are coming for us all and um to, you know to go back to prophecy that's all about mercury and the environment and just any number of movies that are about man's relationship to nature and how we are upsetting the balance and, and I think maybe that's because the 70s were not that there weren't ecological movements um, and environmental movements in the 60s, but the 70s feels like that's when it really took hold and became part of popular culture. Right. Um, and, and of course, you've got, you know, a, a conversation in, in the movie happening about like how, you know, they're all the, the, the female character in the movie, uh, both Bo Derek and Charlotte Rampling are sort of connected to nature to some degree. Cause like Bo Derek, even though she doesn't say much in this movie, one of the things she does say is like, we, we should not be doing this. We are, we are treading on ground that, uh, does not belong to us. And of course, Charlotte Rampling is the big advocate for, you know, aquatic life and leaving the whales the hell alone. Um, and it's sort of the men of the movie that particularly Richard Harris that just kind of goes fumbling into vengeance. Right. And, she said like, she doesn't say something to the effect of like, you know, I, sh I knew I should have told you these things because all men like you wants to do is kill or capture. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, like she, she's interested in giving a better understanding where he is just consuming. Yeah, I, you're going to make a buck off of capturing these animals and selling them to the highest bidder. You don't care about them. You only care about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, again, not... A, not incorrect. Also, not un surprising for a movie made at this time. I think what is surprising is that... You know, like, I think they really thought they were making a movie that could win awards. Yeah. And, and so having these kinds of discussions between the characters, um, the environmental stuff for sure, um, and also the relationship, like the, the whole thing about family and, and what it can drive you to do, and Richard Harris feeling like he is, you know, somewhat um, uh, cowardly for not having that same sense of righteous anger and vengeance that the whale does, and... You know, like the, the I, I find it really striking that line where he says, you know, the the whale loved his family more than I love mine. Right. And it's it that to me makes the movie 
more interesting than a lot of this crop of Jaws ripoffs. Yeah, I, I can. I haven't seen a ton, but I, I can see that that moment. Yeah, in that performance. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, again, I'm grading on a bit of a curve here because mm -hmm. I like, I like this era of monsters are going to come get you and your children movies. And so often that's as far as the idea goes, you know? Right. Um, so the fact that this movie does kind of rip off Moby Dick in in a way that i mean again not hidden there's nothing surprising about the way that it does it but it at least has those kinds of ambitions i was about to say this movie is, is way ambitious um probably to its detriment yeah yeah uh, any other any other thoughts about like anything under the surface? Because not, not no. All right, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. So let let me turn you loose on this one then, because we have reached our final thoughts. Uh, at, at the at the end of this, feel free to give this guy uh, a score. Um, as always, we do a a five star scale here. We do allow half stars. We do not allow quarter stars because we are not monsters. Well, yeah. No. Um, but just what, with all of the ingredients that we've discussed after, and especially after having this, you know, childhood experience with it and watching it in totem as an adult, where do you, where do you land with a movie like this? Okay. Deep breath. Okay, so here's here's the thing that I think is the best part of this movie that we haven't talked about is the score. Mm, yeah, I can, I'm sure I'm gonna. I always butcher his name, but Inigo Morricone is that how you say it? I, I always heard Inigo Morricone, but I am Morricone. I have got a thick southern tongue, so God only knows. Right. So he is a. I was shocked when I saw that he he does the score for this when when I when I started it. I was like, oh, that's actually a big plus because he did good the bad and the ugly is one of my favorite scores of all time the thing um the hateful eight like on and on it was just like the, the the very top but he's on so many scores and i really like it in this movie um it just it just has his vibe and mm -hmm. it's just it's really comforting and really i thought i actually i i'm like i kind of want to i i need to look for it on spotify because i really liked it um cast is good just the dial the dialogue is just really bad <laughs> yeah and robert it, town did a, a theoretically did a pass on this the guy who wrote chinatown yeah but you know i think the the biggest problem of this movie apart from any technical things is that we're telling jaw it's just that we're telling jaws from quinn's perspective mm-hmm mm because that's what this character is. It's just Quint. Um, and there's just, there's no, it's just not redeemable. Like, I guess I kind of like him, but he's also kind of an asshole. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd like to have a beer with this guy, but as far as like the heart of a movie. I mean, he's a murderer uh, by, by this movie's count. He has killed at least, you know, the mother and mm -hmm. the child of the of the real hero of the movie the orca right so yeah so you're telling jaws from quinn's perspective and that and, and if and again if jaws was was that movie it would not be as good because the whole point of jaws is telling from the everyman that anyone can like put their plate put their shoes into you everyone can relate to you know the, the city guy you know who's kind of gone to this beach town you know we all we're we as the audience it's our sur audience surrogate um, and that's kind of what made, that's one of the one of the things that makes Jaws work so well, putting it from his perspective and making him the character and like you're just kind of I'm, I was rooting for him to die. I know that's bad. that makes me a terrible person, but um, I was just waiting for him to to get it and seeing all these people being killed like just for him to, to do his big sacrifice not, or or have his moment. I was just kind of like, dude. It, it it just does not work for me. 
Um, <laughs> so again, yeah, you're you're trying. So we basically, yeah, they're trying to make something comparable to Jaws, add in a huge dash of Moby Dick. Um, and like I said, the continuity between the stock footage and the the animatronic footage, like there's obviously night shot uh, day shots being used at night. It just doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. um, again, the model work is actually pretty decent. Not uh, the model work, the, the um, animatronic work. Is, yeah. is pretty good. I'll give it that. Um, but also, I, I I feel in the 70s, they have encyclopedias and books of knowledge to about whales, uh, well, <laughs> about orcas. So they, they, they like say so many wrong things. I know we keep saying whale, but or orcas are not whales; they're dolphins. Mm -hmm. It's it's a translation uh, mix up that they're called killer whales. They're actually whale killers. They're dolphins that kill whales. It's just one of those cultural things where we just got in our heads. But it's like if you're gonna make a movie about an orca, especially with a scientist, you should be like correcting people. Right? Yeah. G get the science right because there's basic a, science. You could still make the movie with a few uh, like little nudges. To make it correct, <laughs> mm -hmm. but but you would have to make the orc a, a female and not a male because the male just would never care about. Right. I mean, I can I can get past the fact that okay, the, the male Chris pissed that he killed his his mate. Okay, I can buy that on a very basic level. Like, mm -hmm. but yeah, the whole thing about him blowing up the gas plant and finding his house is just. So over that, like, who wrote that and thought that makes sense? Yeah, it's very silly. It's really silly, and this is a fun watch if you want a silly movie. If you want a good movie, it's not at all a good movie. Um, but they they're trying really hard. They put mm. money into it. I, I I'm kind of torn because do I give it points for being silly? I guess I have to go with what I think they're trying to do. I think they're trying to make a prestige Jaws movie. Mm -hmm. And I think it fails at that. Okay. What, whatever so, your heart tells you to do. I'm not here to judge you. No, I know. I'm just, I'm just talking it through. You're here. You're here to judge. Uh, so yeah, I, I agree. Like, I think that's a, a distinction you kind of have to make with this movie is, am I, am I judging this on how entertained I was while I watched the movie or how successful the movie is at what it was trying to do. Right. And I think mm -hmm. if they cut out some like 15 minutes and make it a lot tighter, because there's a lot of like, we're just going to sit here and talk about whale vengeance. <laughs> sure. Scenes. So they will cut out some of those and sped things up a bit. I think it would have been more enjoyable to watch. One of my favorite Chuck Norris movies, Whale Vengeance. There you go. Um. Yeah, I'm going with a two. All right, that's. I give it, I give it points for trying. And again, if if you go back one day from when recording this and it's 4:20, and you want to watch something to make you laugh, go for it. Yeah, and also if you want to be shocked, yes, to your core, like you know, in the in the words of ACDC, shook to your foundations. Um, by this whale abortion scene, it's yeah. stunning. I mean, really, save yourself the trouble and just go on YouTube and watch it. Watch that 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 scene, and maybe the ending scene, just to see like how overly dramatic it gets. Yeah. Uh, all right, I respect that. My my score is going to be a little bit higher because uh, I I do have a fair amount of nostalgia for this movie. Mm -hmm. And also, it's just in the wheelhouse of, no pun intended, of movies that I I like even though it's not successful. Um, that, and that's, yeah. And based on that, you're, yeah, I, that would totally make a, a higher rating based on that criteria. Yeah, like, I will acknowledge, like, characters are completely unresolved. You know, particularly the Will Sampson character. He shows up to do nothing there are plenty of characters that are are just kind of 
grist for the mill. Like, these are characters that the whale is going to kill, and they serve no other purpose uh, in, in the narrative. And it, they don't even, like, try to hide it with any, like, cat and mouse. They're just like, okay, that Ken guy's there. We're, we left. It's time to come off. Right. There, he might as well, you know, like, do the hot shots thing of, like, you know, patting his chest. So, like, I've got him all, all the secrets of the JFK assassination right here. What mm -hmm. could possibly happen? Uh, yeah, it, it, none of that really works. But it's the movie is 92 minutes long. You cut out the absolutely unbearable final song. Oh, <laughs> which, God. Which is... It's Ennio Morricone music with this vocalist over the top of it who has written lyrics about how we are all one, you know, creature in the eyes of God or something. It's, it is the kind of thing that you play at someone when you're interrogating them. It's terrible. But yeah. so you cut that out and you're down to a breezy 89 minutes. And uh, I think it's, I th if you've never seen Orca, I would recommend watching it because there are moments that are really bonkers. It's really, like you said, the the Orca showing up at Richard Harris's house is head scratching, but in a way that I can really get behind because I like dumb shit like that. Oh, I, I'm, I totally will admit to liking dumb shit. I do think if you're into any kind of cult genre movies, this is definitely one. I definitely recommend it. Yeah. Once. Right, right. One time, and like I'm a weirdo, and I've got it on Blu-ray. So, mm -hmm. and you should not. Do well, that's that. no, that's and that's a nostalgia thing, and that's fine. Everyone yeah. has that has those movies. Yeah. Um, I like Howard the Duck. Go we'll figure. Oh, that um, is a rough one. Yeah, <laughs> but so this is a movie you should only watch once sober. Yes, 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 yes. Any and, other any other time, you need to be under some sort of influence and not alone. Watch it with a yeah. group of people or with your significant other or whatever so that you can get the goofs out of it. And mm -hmm. then every now and then you'll stop and be like, you know what? That that wasn't half bad. And then the silliness will, will start again. So yeah. uh, So for me, and this is not an over-the-top score, it, it's, it's a solid three stars for me, which in my grading system is just a nudge to yeah you should watch it it's not like it, i am not ambivalent about this movie i think that it's entertaining but also it is nonsense and no, everyone's everyone's entitled to you know their thing and their movie and yeah sometimes a terrific failure can be a lot of fun absolutely so before i i completely cut you loose here uh let us talk about three things that you may not know about the movie work okay hit me all right so um when the uh dino de Laurentiis, you may not be surprised to learn saw jaws and decided hey we need to do one of those hmm. and so he went to his producer a guy named luciano vincenzoni and he said i need you to find me a fish that's bigger than a great white shark and so it was Vin, uh, Vincent jo Vincent Zoni's brother, who was a zoologist, who was like, "Oh, you should probably look at orcas." That is how this movie got made. I'm not surprised in the least. Um, also, according to the the producer Luciano Vincent Zoni, Richard Harris uh, was drinking a lot on this set, which I mentioned earlier, but. The reason is, is because he read a gossip magazine that had a picture of his wife on a beach with a younger man. And mm. so he wanted to stop production and fly to Malibu so he could murder them. And this led to a fist fight between Richard Harris and the producer of this movie. Uh, which resulted in Richard Harris not flying to Malibu to murder his wife and her young lover, but did result in the black eye on uh, Vincent Zoni. Was he going to use one of the unforgivable spells? 
<laughs> uh, uh, apparently, uh, she was dating a man who had a horcrux. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go any further with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the, the puns only get worse from there. And then, the final thing you may not know about Orca the Killer Whale... Uh, based on the success of both uh, King Kong, and, and Orca was a, a pretty moderate success as well, uh, Dino De Laurentiis decided that he wanted to produce a movie in which he could bring these two properties together, and King Kong and Orca would fight. No. Yes. On, on How? I, that I don't have the answer to. I mean, how... A whale in the... Look, this is a whale that knew uh, flammability, knew, uh, you know, geography. I think the whale went to the future and told him that that was a bad idea. I would give a substantial amount of money to see that movie. Like, he's in like a production meeting. He's like, dude, no. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, what a... <laughs> When did our board get this rather tall, slippery gentleman wearing the hat and overcoat? What? It's what? not a, it, It's it's the opposite of that Gremlins two Key and Peele sketch. <laughs> yeah, except it's just shutting it down. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a whale in a man in like a suit. Yeah. No, that's not going to be in the movie. Not in the movie. Um, and instead, that the movie that Dino De Laurentiis wanted to make with Orca and, and King Kong ultimately became King Kong Lives, the Lind Lindell Hamilton sequel to uh, the 76 Kong, which is really bad. Uh, wasn't... The, the Originally, Godzilla, wasn't this supposed to be like part whale or the name he, was originally supposed to mean part whale or something like that? There's some uh, connection between Godzilla and whale. Um, probably. The, I, I don't know that. It. I feel like that is something I ought to know, and I, I am, I, I don't want to pretend that I do. Um, but that is probably something that is true. Um. um okay, so the name Gojira is basically a mixture of two Japanese words that mean gorilla and whale. Mm, whale gorilla, which is perfect for the Dino De Laurentiis movie. Exactly. So we technically did get that with Godzilla versus King Kong. Oh man, that is a terrific movie. Not the recent was, one. I'm talking about the old one. Oh, uh, I haven't seen that in a long time. Oh man, it, you should watch it as an adult because that movie is predicated on the fact that Kong in that film is completely strung out on red berries, and everything oh, right. he does is motivated by getting some more of that sweet, sweet berry. It's mm -hmm. it's terrific. Anyway. He's on He's on the hooch. He's, oh, it's harder than that. I think that this is a real like chasing the dragon situation. Oh wow! Yeah, because because he eats too much of it and passes out. Like it's there's something going on with Kong in that movie, and I love it. Um, anyway, uh, as as promised, um, please direct people to where they can find all that you do so that they can hear more stories of animals traveling to the future and uh, sitting in on film production meetings. Oh, man. All right. So, yeah, my podcast is Dads from the Crypt. We're in all your podcatchers. Um, we are on Instagram at Dads from the Crypt. I think we actually we actually have a, a pretty good Instagram uh, following. We have... I lucked out so much when I started podcast unwittingly picking one co-host who is a graphic design artist or like a Photoshop genius. So we can just whip out really cool um, artwork mm -hmm. for all of our episodes. So we actually have a lot of cool stuff we post on uh, Instagram and just funny memes and other, you know, shit. And then my other co-host is, is really good at editing. So I have to deal with either of those things. It makes my life so much easier. Um, but yeah, so we were on Instagram. We have got good stuff going on there. We're on Twitter at Crypt Dads um, because Twitter didn't like how long Dads in the Crypt was, so it gave us a shortened option. So we went with that because that's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, we're on Facebook, but it, it, I pretty much just said it. So anything I post on Instagram it automatically goes to Facebook, so I don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that's it. You know, we post at least once a week. Um, 
we do an episode of, we do a, an official episode of the week if we can get someone that was directing or acting or producing or something to do with the episode we'll do that and we also got our bordello blood uh mini series i don't know when this episode comes out but it should probably be wrapped up around that but you can go back and watch all uh listen to all that oh we also just started posting uh videos of our review episodes on youtube so you can watch our lux- luscious beards talk to each other excellent man uh and i really appreciate you doing this this, this has been a lot of oh, fun. It's fun so uh all right well uh i will be right back to close out the show uh so everybody stick around All right, so there you have it. That is uh, Jason Stein from uh, Dads from the Crypt. Again, uh, be sure that you're subscribing to that channel and at the very least, give it a listen. I think you're really going to like it. Um, so a couple of other things for this episode uh, before we uh, we call it a day. If you are not aware, you should be seeing uh, chapter markers on all of the shows, a little bit of, of technical know-how um as you may or may not know legion podcast is now being run by a guy named kevin and kevin um has been great about suggesting hey here are some improvements to the listener experience and hopefully you're enjoying that chapter selection option on these shows and uh i'll I'll be doing that more and more um with the the other shows that are released the only show that's an exception to that is heart of horror because that's really just one kind of freeform conversation everything else uh and and found footage fool is too short really to to do chapters so everything else though we'll we'll have chapter markers on it i I hope you find some utility in that and enjoy it uh and i want to say a thanks to kevin for not just picking up the mantle and taking over legion podcast but also you know starting off with some small user improvements that hopefully make uh the lives better for those uh, listening to the show you can find more out of me at dark parade pod on twitter uh which i i visit about once a day but you can leave me a message there and i will certainly get it you can also find uh, the dark parade on facebook and uh, that is uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash dark parade. But if you go to uh, legionpodcasts.com forward slash the dash dark dash parade, then you can find uh, all of the old episodes. And more importantly, you can find links to uh, the Discord server, and that's where I am more than anywhere else is on Discord. And it gets away from the social media and that kind of thing. So if you want to check out the show uh, or or find me um, outside of the show, then that's probably the best place to do it. And you will also see a link there to a GoFundMe. Uh, I'm, you know, kind of coming hat in hand to listeners of the show. Uh, where I am uh, basically going back to school to get my teaching certification. I don't know if you've been watching the news, uh, but here in Tennessee, our legislature has done a lot of pretty heinous stuff uh, in terms of book banning and book approvals and are working to essentially privatize education here in the state of Tennessee, uh, which leaves behind a lot of people. And so... I'm basically going back to school so I can be a public school teacher and, you know, make no money and, uh, but hopefully be on the front lines of a fight to make sure that, that kids in this state, um, get quality education. And it's something I feel very strongly about. Also, I, I'm going to be teaching English and, and hopefully critical thinking and reasoning and, uh, and trying to make a difference, right? Like just trying to make the world a, a little bit of a better place. So Um, If you're listening to the show and you want to support that cause because uh, it costs some money and I'm not going to be making a whole lot of money um, to to finish up uh, my certification so I can get back in school, I've got kind of a hard limit of, hey, here's what it's going to cost me to finish uh, that certification and get in schools and anything I make above that. And it's a fairly liberal goal to be to be fair. Um, you know, it's going to cost about 10 grand to do all of it. And I'm just trying to get out of it with as few student loans as possible. But if I were to somehow make above $10,000 in the pursuit of this, all of that would go to another teacher that is trying to get certified. Uh, and, and it shares those same kinds of goals, right? That we, we want to try to, uh, fight against this tide of, of sort of, you know, censorship and oppression, 
Um, you know, I know uh, the, the GOP party here likes to say they are all about free speech on the one hand, while on the other, uh, coming up with a list of approved books that students are allowed to read, uh, as opposed to just the free flow of ideas that you want to see in a public school library. Um, so all that said, you can go to legionpodcast.com forward slash the dash dark dash parade and, uh, and find links to the discord server and the GoFundMe if you want to help with any of that stuff. Again, I appreciate anything, uh, in, in that regard. If you want to leave a buck or two, that that's great. I appreciate it. Um, every little bit helps and I am, uh, I'm excited about getting back in school in a weird way, but also, um, it's kind of a frightening time, you know, and a lot of teachers are leaving the, the profession and I'm kind of rushing towards it, uh, to hopefully uh, do some good. Anyway, all that being said, we've got three more movies, uh, this here, uh, month on, uh, the dark parade that, um, are all about aquatic horror. And I think you are going to enjoy them. Uh, and, uh, enjoy the host that we have brought on to, uh, to, to help discuss these movies. And, uh, so yeah, stick around guys. Uh, and also I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out, there's going to be a new found footage fool this Friday. Say that fast three times. So anyway, thanks again to Jason for being on this show. Uh, thanks to you guys for listening. And most of all, thank you for joining the dark parade. See you next time.